Okay, so welcome to everybody. We'll start the second session of the day. And uh, we'll start with the, the best student paper, uh, with title Intermediate Value Linearizability, a Quantity Correctness Criteria. We already uh, listened a, a little bit about this, and uh, Arik Ringberg is uh, presenting the paper. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to be presenting uh, intermediate value neurosability. This is the work I did um, with my supervisor, Dieter Dahl, and, the, and I'm a PhD student at the uh, Technion. So the motivation from this work, you've heard uh, a great deal um, about what Edith uh, uh, explained. We come from the world of big data, um, where everything's processed on large systems using multi-core servers. Uh, and a, uh, uh, a base data structure or algorithm that's used to process incoming streams are data sketches, which are statistical summaries. So uh, analyzing the motivation for using linearizability going back was in order to be able to assume that the object behaves as an atomic object would, even though it's not truly atomic. So for approximation algorithms, we wanted to, uh, we, we set out to find a, a correctness criterion which would base, do the same thing for such algorithms, for such objects, where the um, uh, probability and error, uh, the probability and error analysis would carry over from the sequential uh, setting to the concurrent one, basically preserving the guarantees. So let's take a look at a motivating example, a simple example where we have a batch counter. We have a uh, two servers, server A and server B, and we have a controller, which is the laptop, and it needs to decide whether another server is needed or not. Um, and it decides that another server is needed if it sees that there are 50 connections in total. So using a batch counter, the, uh, um, the controller reads the counter that's sitting on A, it sees 24, reads the counter on B, sees 18, sees that there are 42 connections and decides no, another server is needed, right? But this is when everything's happening sequentially, what, ha what, what happens when things start happening uh, concurrently in parallel? So let's say six people uh, connect to server A and server A begins handling these six new connections. Uh, in parallel, the uh, controller decides to see if another server is needed or not. So it begins reading the counter on server A. Server A hasn't finished handling the connections, so it still returns 24. It then finishes handling the connections and 10 people begin uh, connecting to server B. Um, the, uh, the controller then reads the counter at server B. Server B finishes handling the connections, so it returns 10 more than previous, so it returns 28. So the controller sees that there are 52 people and I know that I'm gonna have an overload and need to uh, spin up another server, right? So looking at the time series analysis of this simple example, we have a read concurrent to an increment of six, which is followed by an increment of 10. So the counter begins at 42 and ends at 58. And what we'd like to know is, is this history linearizable? Is this object linearizable, right? So it's very easy to see that the read returns 52. So um, under linearizability, we can return either 42, which is the read before both increments, in between, which is 48, or after, which is 58. So this read returns 52, so it's not linearizable, right? And the question we ask is, what's wrong with 52? I just wanted to know if I needed to spin up another server or not. At 58, I would. At 52, I did. So the outcome was the same. Or what would be wrong with uh, reading 45, right? At 42 or 48, I don't spin up another server. So what's wrong with 45? But what's wrong with any of the numbers between 42 or 58, right? And that's basically the intuition behind IVL. Well, we say, well, there's nothing wrong, inherently wrong with any of these numbers. So let's allow the return of any numbers that are between two bounds. In order to define uh, IVL, we first uh, define the notion of skeleton histories, and a skeleton history is uh, of, a, of a history H, is where we replace the return values of all read operations uh, with a question mark, basically saying, I don't really know what this is yet. Um, but to, so now we need to, so now we have skeleton histories, and we need to be able to move from skeleton histories to histories that mean something with real values. So we define the operator tau. The operator tau takes any sequential specification H with a sequential uh, history, and it applies the correct return values under the sequential specification. So in the example, um, the, read is, uh, the read happens after the increment of six, where the counter started at 42, so it returns 48 after applying tau. So we can now define IVL to be such that, um, given a concurrent history H, if there exists two linearizations, H1 and H2, of the skeleton history, so the linearizations are of the skeleton history, uh, 
such that the return value of every read operation is bounded between tau operating on h1 and tau operating on h2, then h is IVL. So continuing the example before, uh, how would we know if it's IVL or not? We consider all skeleton histories, so all linearizations of the skeleton history, so the read before, the read in between, and the read after, and we apply tau. So here I've already applied tau. The read before returns 42, in between 48, and after 58. And well, let's see if the read value is bounded between two of them. Well, here they are. It's bounded between 48 and 58. So here we can say that H is indeed uh, IVL. Okay. And so this is uh, good for uh, data sketches. And data sketches are epsilon delta bounded objects. We capture the semantics using the notion of epsilon delta bounded objects, where such objects uh, for an ideal value V return an estimate that's uh, approximately correct with probability at least uh, one minus delta. And there are many examples all of the data sketches uh, that we've already discussed and heard about today. So the main theorem that we prove is that a concurrent IVL implementation of an epsilon delta bounded object is itself epsilon delta bounded object, which going back to uh, the reason we use linearizability is what we need for epsilon delta bounded objects. IVL preserves the error probability from uh, the sequential setting into the concurrent one, right? So IVL is sufficient for epsilon delta bounded objects, okay? So uh, we prove or we show uh, uh, in the full paper, we define it a bit more rigorously. We define IVL also for randomized uh, uh, objects. Um, it's cheaper than linearizability. We show in the paper that uh, we can implement a batch counter cheaper than any using uh, multi-reader single writer uh, registers cheaper than any possible implementation using linearizability. And we show that it's also local. And an interesting, uh, um, an interesting fact about IVL is that it's adaptive to contention. So when there's no contention, IVL is equal to linearizability. It requires that the execution adhere to the sequential specification. But when there's a lot of contention, IVL allows for flexibility, allowing for a, a wide range of uh, um, return values. So for more details, you can see the paper and you can see the full talk. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, we already have a question from Shai. Do you have an example of something that is, will not be linearizable under that more relaxed notion? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, I'm trying to also bring up the chat and I can't. An example of an object that's not linearizable using any other relaxation? Well, the batch counter I gave here, right? It returns uh, 52. 52 isn't correct under any relaxation. Um, and for every relaxation that's bounded, I can find an unbounded example that would be allowed under IVL. Um, I don't want to say that it's true for every single relaxation, um, but I guess I, using an example uh, and using 52, a specific one, I'd be able to uh, 52 is, is IVL, right? 52 is IVL here, yeah. So do you have something that is not IVL? I mean, IVL is some kind of a relaxation, right, in yeah. some sense. So do you have something that is not? An object uh, that's not ideal that is linearizable? But, well, it's, that is nothing, whatever. I mean, maybe everything is IVL. Well, if you look at the example of a non-monotonic counter, then it's not IVL, I mean, or something that updates the most significant- uh, That might go bytes. down. Yeah or you update the, the most significant bit and then the byte and then the less significant byte and then you have in the middle, you have garbage, that's not going to be IVL. Okay. Just, just yeah. an arbitrary okay. algorithm is not going to be IVL. Mm -hmm. uh, but arbitrary algorithms aren't going to have any guarantees. So we'd be hard, okay. hard uh, done by uh, to yeah, find I anything interesting. Of, I just thought of, of a counter that goes up. Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah. Okay, yeah. What's oh, interesting so, about negative counters is that uh, we're not sure whether we'll, IVL is inherently cheaper than linearizability. The, we don't have so much time left. Uh, there is one more comment by Gary that this seems to be related to Lamport's paper, concurrent reading and writing of clocks. So that's uh, an interesting comment. But, so we don't have much time to discuss. Uh, thank you very much again. Very interesting thank you. paper. And congratulations for the, for the work. And uh, so we, we got for the next uh, paper, uh, which the, we titled Display List, a Distribution Adaptive Corporate Skip List, and that uh, Vitaly Aksenov is presenting the paper.
Okay, I will present you the paper, this playlist to distribution adaptive skip list. It is done in joint work with Dana Listar from IST Austria, Alexander Dazdo from IT University, and Emirki Ivan Mokhtashami from EPFL. So what is our goal? Our goal is to create a concurrent data structure that answers on many, many concurrent requests, which are of three types, contains, insert, and delete. Typically, the data structures are tested under uniform workloads, whether each element is requested with the same probability. However, in real life, more distributions are skewed, uh, which means that some elements are requested more frequently than others. However, most of the concurrent state-of-the-art algorithms do not adapt to the distribution. And I think it is not very good because if you adapt to the distribution in the static case, for example, you obtain a statically optimal data structure, which, which complexity on each request is uh, smaller than all of logarithm m. To be more precise, it is all of logarithm m over pi, where m is the total number of requests, and pi is the total number of requests per element i. So there are lots of statically optimal sequential data structures. There are trees and skip lists, and there is only one concurrent data structure which is based on trees, which is CB tree. Unfortunately, CB tree has a few shortcomings. For example, one of them is that even contained separation works by hand over hand validation. So it is not very good. Why do you think that uh, we will try to take skip list and we think that it will be much better than CB tree because we can do without hand-over-hand uh, -hand validation, because if you get to the lower level, you can still find the element on their lower level list. So can we build a better alternative or a top of skip list? It appears that we can. Uh, we name it playlist and it's based on skip list. So we store per each, we, we store uh, the number of hits per each element. In other words, the number of operations that were done per each element and how the operation performs, it traverses to the place as in the skip list, then updates the hits, and update the backwards data structure, and rebalance it backwards, like on, not on the forward path, but on the backward path. And there are two conditions. There is the descent condition, whether for each neighbors on the same level, if the total number of requests per their rectangles here, or, or sub trees uh, in the skip list sense, if the, if the total number of hits is small, then we don't need to have two shortcuts on that level, so we can uh, reduce the level of U. And the some condition is that if the total number of requests per this rectangle, or the number of requests per the suffix, or mo even more um, simpler, the number of requests that passed through element U, then U could be shortcut, then it can go up. So for example, this cat checks its number of hits, Unfortunately, it is small, so he has to go down. So, uh, so what is the structure of an operation, typical? So we traverse to the place, then we do something there, we increase hits and traverse back and rebalance everything. This is how contains works. The deletion works, we go to the place and instead of do something, we mark their element as logically deleted. And when you make an insert, you come to the element, if it exists and if it is marked as deleted, then we simply unmark, or we insert a new element on the lowest level. So there is the theorem that if we use our rebalancing conditions, then the operation that hits u takes all logarithm m over hits of u amortized time, so it is statically optimal. All other operations that doesn't hit an element take all logarithm of m, where m is the total number of operations and hits u is the total number of hits per element u. However, it's obviously like the rebalancing part is very costly, so we should improve this part. So for example, let us do the rebalance periodically. So for example, if we perform rebalancing only one operation out of C, for example, the operation that hits U it takes of C times logarithm M over hits of U. So you only multiply it by some constant C. Uh, there is no there is no such proof for CB3. However, we have this proof for our playlist about concurrency. I told that we are rebalancing on the uh, forward or on the backwards path. It seems to be very inefficient because it has to lock all the path to the element. For example, I we presented the way how to do this in the forward path with hand over handle locking. Okay, so here is our execution results. Uh, we run the sequential execution on five workloads where we have 10 to the power of five keys and 90% of operations are on 10% of the keys. So it's kind of skewed workload. So we have 95% of keys 
per or oh, 95 percent of operations per five percent of keys and 99 percent of operations per one percent of keys so these workloads are more skewed uh, more, the later workload is more skewed than the first one so we chose the best update rate for cb3 and playlist which is 100 so we update only once out of 100 operations and we found that playlist outperforms their skip list, which is the baseline, by 1.12 in their less skewed case and by 2.01 in their more skewed case. And this happens because the, path, the average path becomes shorter. So it was 1.3x for the first workload and 1.67 for the latest workload. The CB2 unfortunately runs a little bit faster because it's a more compact data structure and it better works in their sequential case where you don't have to share with other processors. But as you can see, the more skewed the workload, there we close the gap between playlist and CB3. At first it was 1.6 or something like that, and at the end it is 1.2, which is much better. And here is about concurrent execution. We compare our data structure with skip list. So this we have uniform workload, like three hour workloads and one zip one workload. And the red squares show that we lose to the corresponding data structures. And the green squares show that we are better. So the more skewed the data structure, the better we are, as, as predicted. So here is the takeaway. We present the new self-adjusting data structure, which is skip list with simple ascent and descent conditions. We show a relaxed version with guarantees. We show the concurrent log-based implementation. And it appears to be faster on screw of our plots and high number of processors. Thank you very much. And there are more cats in the long talk. Thank you very much, Vitaly. Is there any question? Well, I have a question. Uh, is there any other ascendant descendant condition that makes sense, or, uh, have, or have you tried to? I don't, I don't know. So, so the main. So, so as as you can see, the main idea of the descent condition is that we simply don't need to have a lots of elements on the level so we reduce reduce the level right so it is it is kind of binary search tree in some sense it is very similar it has some intuition as cb3 so if you have a lot of elements in the subtree then you should put this element on the or higher or if it has small number of elements then you put it lower so here is the intuition unfortunately in the straightforward manner as this intuition is it wasn't, I wasn't, we wasn't able to prove. But with this, like, kind of, like, the ascent condition is much more the same as it can be, but their descent condition can checks two neighboring elements, which is, can be not very straightforward why it works, but suddenly it works. It works. So, we, we, unfortunately, we haven't come up with another simpler condition. I see, I see. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I have a I have yeah. a question. Um, yes, have you have you evaluated the the display list with uniform distribution uh, keys? Uh, how much worse it gets uh, yeah, compared so, to so the baseline? This, yeah, so this is exactly the slide. So on uniform, unfortunately, we lose us two times. That's in the concurrent execution and sequential. That's in, in concurrent execution. Yeah, that's in concurrent yeah. execution. It's just on seventy two processors. Okay, thank you. And, and, and this, this, are, this are kind of only contains operations. So, because we are updated backwards, so we lose something because we have, we have bigger nodes, we have like everything a little bit bigger, so we lose in the uniform case. Yeah, I see. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you again, Vitaly. Thank uh, you very much. So, okay, now our next paper is. Uh, Efficient multi word compare and swap. And uh, Igor uh, Sablocci is uh, presenting the paper. I hope my pronunciation is not so bad. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, and uh, thank you all for uh, virtually attending this uh, very short overview of our paper, Efficient Multi Word Compare and Swap. Uh, my name is Igor Zablotsky. And this is joint work with my advisor, Rashid Grawi from EPFL, and with Alex Kogan and Virendra Marate from Oracle Labs. And in a nutshell, uh, our work is about a novel multi-word comparison swap algorithm, which is nearly optimal with respect to the number of comparison swap instructions used. Um, 
And let me start with a very brief overview of multi-word compare and swap or MCAS for short. So MCAS is a generalization of the well-known and widely used compare and swap primitive for shared memory. Um, MCAS takes a list of addresses, a list of expected values, and a list of new values. And it compares the contents of the addresses to the expected values. If they all match, then the new values are installed atomically. Otherwise, if one or more of the addresses do not contain their expected values, nothing happens. So no address is modified. Um, as you can tell, MCAS is, quite a, is a quite powerful primitive because it allows us to atomically and conditionally update multiple words, even if they are not uh, one after the other in memory. And this has the potential to be very useful, especially to simplify complex algorithms. And a good, and a good example of a class of algorithms which can be simplified are log-free implementations of comp uh, complex data structures. If you consider a double linked list, uh, for example, you know, inserting or removing a node from the uh, doubly linked list requires modifying two uh, pointers, at least two pointers atomically. And of course you can do this, there are ways to do this with single word compare and swap, but having MCAS available makes it simpler and thus less error prone. Another great example are B-trees where inserting a, inserting a new entry can cause a node split or even a multi-level split. And this again requires atomically modifying several pointers. Um, but of course, this power of MCAS does not come for free. In fact, MCAS is typically not provided natively in hardware, and thus we have to implement it in software. And existing implementations of MCAS are, are usually based on single word compare and swap, and they make heavy use of uh, single word compare and swap. More precisely, uh, these existing uh, implementations used between 2K plus one and 6K plus two compare and swap instructions for a K word compare and swap or a K word MCAS. And this is in the common case when there's no contention, but of course the complexity can grow even higher with contention due to, uh, for example, restarts or helping. Another characteristic of existing implementations is that uh, they uh, often, often the ones that have lower complexity, they uh, require read-only operations to write to shared memory. And this has been shown by previous work to be uh, undesirable because it limits scalability. Now, sure, as we all know, CAS, each one of these 2K plus one to 6K plus two CAS instructions is expensive and can take up to hundreds of cycles, hundreds of cycles to execute. All of this begs the natural question, what is the minimal number of compare and swap instructions required to implement MCAS. Uh, this is the question that we address in our work uh, through a, uh, a number of contributions. Our first contribution is an, an efficient MCAS algorithm for volatile memory. So our algorithm uh, requires only K plus one single word CASes for a K word MCAS in the common uncontended case. So again, this is to be contrasted with 2K plus one to up to 6K plus two cases for previous work. Additionally, our algorithm has the desirable property, property that readers do not write to shared memory in the common uncontended case. Uh, furthermore, uh, we have an experimental uh, evaluation which confirms the intuition that having lower complexity uh, tra translates to better performance in many, in many cases. Our second contribution is an extension of our volatile uh, memory algorithm to work with persistent memory. This extension preserves the same low complexity of K plus one cases uh, in the common case. And our algorithm for persistent memory additionally requires only two persistent fences for a K word MCAS. This is uh, to be compared with 2K plus one for state of the art algorithms. And our final contribution is to show that our MCAS algorithms are nearly optimal with respect to the number of compare and swap instructions used. Uh, more precisely, we prove a lower bound of K single word compare and swap instructions for uh, implementing any K word MCAS if that implementation is log free and disjoint access parallel. Um, I think that's my time. So thank you for your attention. And I invite you to check out our full video for the intuition behind our algorithms 
and our paper for the full details. Thank you again. There are, thank you, thank you very much, Igor. There are a couple of questions here. Uh, I will start with the first one. Actually, there are three. Have you assumed that the addresses are known at the freehand for MCAS? Yes, yes. In MCAS, when, when you call the, the operation, you give it the addresses, give it a list of addresses. Okay, and uh, there is a second question. What about the contended case? Is it weight free or lock free? Uh, if, if it's just one question, our algorithm is oh. lock free. Uh, ah, okay. So, yes. Yeah, this is, this is the case. first thing. Uh, the second thing, what about the contended case? What is the, I guess the question is, what is the complexity there? What do you know about that case? Um, well, in the contended, well, in the worst case, the complexity can grow uh, without bound, of course. Uh, but uh, since we have a log free algorithm, but we have some experiments in, uh, in, uh, in our paper to show that in practice, in the contended case, our algorithm performs quite well, uh, better than state of the art. I see. There, is, there are more questions. Uh, how does the efficiency of your MCAS implementation compare to the efficiency of LLX SCX? That's a great question. Um, however, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer it off the top of my head. I'm not sure what the efficiency of LLX and SCX is off the top of my head. Yeah, that, that's an interesting discussion though. I see. So we still have time for questions. You mentioned that the pure work known worst case are 2K plus 1, 2CK plus 2. What about their common case? Uh, I'm sorry, I must have misspoke. So the, these, for this prior work, the best case, which is also the common case, is 2k plus 1 to 6k plus 2. Uh, the worst case is unbounded for most of these. Some, some of them are weight free. So, but uh, the, the worst case is, in, in, a, in every case, higher than what I mentioned there, 2k plus 1 plus, uh, to, up to 6k plus 2. But even in the weight free, uh, these weight free implementations can be unbounded or, or there is... No, no, of course not. But uh, it's not... The, the weight free, uh, I believe the, the worst case is worse than the best case, even for, for those weight free implementations. Okay, so maybe this partially uh, ask a, this a question by Gadi. What do you know about weight free implementations? I'm not sure exactly how to answer this question. It, it seems a bit too broad. Perhaps we could talk offline. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Maybe we'll, we'll have time for one last question. How, how would MCAS reduces the memory accesses in read operations? How would MCAS reduce memory accesses in read operation? Let me try to understand the question. Um, compared to, it's not clear compared to what? Our algorithm compared to previous work or MCAS compared to other approaches that do not require MCAS? This is not clear to me. Well, maybe you can take this offline where uh... mm -hmm run out of time and uh, well, okay thank you again Igor thank, thank you very much and uh, okay let's move to the next the next uh, talk and uh, the next talk is um, LS, LLSC and uh, atomic copy constant time space efficient implementations using only pointer with case case K, K I S sorry and uh, you Yuan Hao Wei is presenting. Sorry for my terrible pronunciation. Okay, uh, no problem. Um, so, uh, okay, so this presentation is going to be about um, implementing LOSC and atomic copy using just pointer width compare and swap. Um, and so, as an outline of our results, we first use compare and swap to implement a weaker form of LOSC. And weak LOSC has been studied before, but the version that we implement is slightly weaker, and this lets us get some better theoretical properties. And then on top of that, we build on atomic copy. And on top of atomic copy, uh, we implement full LOSC. So LOSC has already proven to be a useful primitive for designing other concurrent algorithms. And uh, we believe that atomic copy will be a useful tool to have as well. Uh, so LOSC performs a similar function to compare and swap, except it's often more intuitive to use because it avoids the ABA problem. Um, however, none of the machines we have today support the full semantics of LOSC. 
Um, and this has motivated lots of work on implementing uh, LOSC from compare and swap. So an early result by Moir showed that you can implement LOSC by just tagging each compare and swap object with an unbounded sequence number. And there have been attempts to bound the size of the sequence numbers um, by, by recycling, these, recycling these tags. Um, however, uh, all of these techniques require at least P space per LOSC object. So they do not scale well with the number of uh, simulated objects. Researchers have also been interested in uh, implementing large LOSC objects. And there has been uh, several works that, uh, that accomplish this in a time efficient and space efficient manner. Um, but all of these algorithms require, go back to requiring unbounded sequence numbers. Uh, so our results shows that you can have all of these nice properties without using unbounded sequence numbers. And furthermore, all the algorithms in this paper use only pointer width uh, read and compare and swap. Um, okay, so our implementation of, a, of LOSC depends heavily on a, new, on a new type of object we define called a destination object. Uh, these destination objects support read, write, and SW copy, which stands for single writer copy. Uh, so this copy operation lets you uh, atomically read a memory location, read an arbitrary memory location, and then write its value into a destination object. And crucially, both the read and the write will appear to have happened at the same time. Um, so uh, in, in our paper, we show how to implement all three of these operations in a weight-free manner in constant time uh, while using m plus p squared space for m destination objects. And here p is the number of uh, processes. OK, so as an example of, um, of why destination objects are useful, we, can, we use them to transform um, a log-free LOSC algorithm into one that is weight-free. So this log-free algorithm uh, uses the standard technique of, uh, of storing everything with a level of indirection uh, with hazard pointers to recycle the memory. So more concretely, um, the object stores a pointer to a buffer, which stores the actual value of the object. And let's call this pointer x. Uh, the LO operation begins, begins by first reading x and then announcing the buffer that it points to. And this announcement prevents the buffer from being garbage collected as we are reading from it. And then the next step is to read x again and check that it's equal to what we announced. Uh, if it's not equal, then we have to restart because we might have announced the value, uh, announced the buffer that was already garbage collected and it wouldn't be safe to read from. Okay, uh, so, so this, is, this loop on line three is what makes the LO operation uh, lock free. Um, so notice that we only run into the problem of announcing a collected buffer if lines three and four of some SC operation happen in between lines one and two of the LO. So another way to fix this problem is by making lines one and two atomic using the single writer copy operation. And this lets us get rid of the loop on line three and it makes the LO operation uh, weight free and constant time. Um, okay, so, so that's, that's essentially how our LOSC from CAS algorithm works. And um, I won't have time to go into too much de to, into detail about our atomic copy primitive, uh, but, the, the, but the algorithm is, um, is, you can, is presented in our paper. Um, so to conclude, I want to talk about some extensions of this single writer copy primitive. Uh, so what, one interesting extension is that you can modify the copy operation so that it applies an arbitrary function to the value before writing it into a destination object. And this would make it behave more like a read, modify, write on two different memory locations. And, we, and this sounds like it should be useful in some applications. Uh, so we hope that atomic copy or one of these extensions would be useful in designing new concurrent algorithms and also simplifying their proofs of correctness uh, because it limits the number of interleavings that are possible. And that's uh, the end of this talk. Uh, thank you for listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Sorry, thank you very much. Is there any question? Uh, yeah, there is one question here in the chat. What does uh, error um, read modified write on two memory locations mean? Oh, okay, I see. It means that you can um, you can atomically read from a memory location, apply a function to it, and then write the result to another memory location, and both the read and the write will. Uh, appear to have happened at the same time. I see.
And uh, here's the question also, can you do a two cast? Uh, can you do a two cast? Oh yeah, yeah, so that's, um, I, I think this can be maybe applied to um, do a double compare single swap. So there, there have already been algorithms for this. Um, and I, I'm not sure how this would compare to, compare to those algorithms. Um, I, I don't think this can be used to do a, a, an exact two cast because that requires modifying two different memory locations. But it might be able to do a double compare and then a single swap. So but it's, it's not clear how to extend your approach to do multiple uh, word compare and swap or? or? Um, yeah, it's not, it's not clear how to like, extend this to, to, uh, to modify two different memory locations. But you can maybe use it to compare. You can compare with maybe two memory locations and then modify a single one. Oh, I see. So, okay. If there are no more questions, thank you again, Yuhao. And uh, now we have a series of three brief announcements. The first one is um, building fast, recoverable, persistent data structures with montage. And uh, uh, I don't know, Hao Sen Wen is presenting the paper. So, uh, hi, I'm Hao Sen Wen from University of Rochester. Uh, we're happy here to talk about a brief announcement, building fast, recoverable, persistent data structure with montage. So this paper is co-authored by me, Wen Tao Tsai, Ming Zhe Du, Benjamin Valpe, and Michael Scott at University of Rochester. So a little bit of background. Uh, Non-volatile byte addressable memory offers the possibility of keeping pointer-rich data structures across program runs and even crashes. However, uh, building such data structures correctly is uh, non-trivial. So in order for a data structure to be recovered into a consistent state, uh, the persistence of the operations need to be very carefully ordered. Uh, but since CPU ca caches are still volatile, uh, stores in the cache can be evicted into NVM in an arbitrary order. Uh, consequently, this uh, persistence order that we talked about uh, need to be enforced with explicit writebacks and fence instructions in those operations. Um, durable linearizability, uh, which was introduced in DISC in 2016, uh, is the correctness criterion used by most existing persistent data structures and systems for uh, non-volatile memory. It is straightforward, but it has high latency in every operation. For example, it requires each operation to be persisted before the return. Uh, the buffered version of durable linearizability has the potential to reduce the latency on persistence ordering, but currently all the existing implementations of uh, durable, uh, buffered durable linearizability uh, are not general. So uh, Montage, the system we built, is the first general system that helps building buffer durable linearizable data structures. So by implementing buffer durable linearizability, Montage reduces the cost of persist ordering of data structures. Uh, it, instead of persisting each operation before return, it persists operations at the granularity of coarse grain epochs. So in short, operations in the same epoch are persisted atomically. If there is a happens before order between two operations, they either have the same epoch order uh, they, they either have the same epoch number or they are persisted uh, together atomically. Uh, in the current implementation, two most recent epochs may, may be lost on a crash because we cannot guarantee they are fully uh, finished and uh, persisted. But we can prove that the remaining history after a crash is consistent with all happens before relationships. Uh, montage uh, besides uh, the implementation of buffer durable linearizability, also further reduces the cost of persistence by only putting abstra uh, abstraction related data in NVM. And the metadata that are rebuildable from those abstract data will be recovered after a crash, which are uh, in DRAM instead of NVM. So for example, a, a montage based ca a hash table will only put keys and values in NVM and all indices structures like hash buckets will be kept in DRAM. Uh, during runtime, a significant proportion uh, of each operation will be DRAM accesses, which are much faster on 
on cash misses comparatively. Uh, after a crash, all indices in DRAM uh, will be rebuilt. Um, montage is suitable for both block-based and non-blocking data structures. And it also, sh and also shows unprecedented performance as a general buffer durable uh, system. In the full version of this paper, we talked about the design of montage, correctness arguments, uh, experimental setups, results, and adaptation of non-blocking data structures in detail. So please follow the, link, uh, the, the links below. Uh, that's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Hassan. Is there any question? Ah, yeah, there is a question here. Are epochs user-defined or internal? Uh, they are internal. Uh, so users uh, call uh, some 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 functions provided by the uh, by the library to uh, to hint the the epoch system inside uh, whether it's a good time to to advance the epoch or not. Uh, and it's the it's it's the system's uh, decision to advance epoch from time to time, and uh, the users have the op option to tune uh, the granularity of epochs. So right now we are having epochs in um, in microseconds to uh, to one millisecond. It's about the, the length of each epoch. Yeah, and then there is one more question. How is the epoch granularity order useful for the application then? So application is not uh, aware of which, which operation is in uh, each epoch. Uh, the only thing that, that they will notice is that uh, when some operation in, the, in an old epoch is trying to access something accidentally got uh, persisted in the new epoch, it will be uh, notified that there might be an order, ordering issue. Um, other than that, um, application does not need to know much about the, uh, the, the, the persistence ordering uh, among operations. Okay, thank you very much. You. Now we move to the next, uh, the next talk, which is again from uh, Yuan Hao. And uh, the paper is uh, uh, concurrent fixed size allocation and free in constant time. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, okay, so th this presentation will be about how to allocate and free fixed size memory blocks in a concurrent setting with asynchronous processes. And this was this is joint work with my advisor Kai Guo. Uh, so the me memory. Memory allocation is an important operation that's used by many lock-free and weight-free data structures. Uh, some data structures require variable size memory blocks, but many are built on fixed size blocks. And that's a problem we focus on in this paper. So our main contribution is a linearizable uh, allocate and free operation. Uh, a linearizable implementation of allocate and free such that both operations take constant time and use uh, K time and has k times p squared space overhead. Uh, so here k is the size of the memory blocks and p is the number of asynchronous processes. Um, so the, this overhead means that we can use, um, th this overhead means that we can allocate all but p squared of the memory blocks that we're managing. Uh, and also our allocator uses at most k times p squared space for internal metadata. Um, and finally, our uh, implementation uses only single word pointer width, read, write, and compare and swap. So while this is mostly meant to be a theoretical contribution, uh, the constants in this algorithm are small. So we believe that it will be useful in practice as well. So there has been a lot of work on implementing lock-free memory allocation, but uh, very little uh, attention has been given to weight-free memory allocation. Uh, the only weight-free solution that we're aware of um, requires p cube space per memory block, which is too much in many applications. Uh, so here's an overview of our algorithm. Um, I won't have time to go into all these parts in detail, uh, but essentially it divides the memory blocks between private pools and a shared pool. Most of the allocated free requests will be handled by the private pools, and the shared pool is used to load balance the private pools uh, to make sure that none of them have too many or too few blocks. So uh, we implement the shared pool 
using a weight-free universal construction called PISA by Fratero and Calamanis, and we modified it to allow for memory management. Um, accessing the shared pool is expensive, so we, um, we transfer blocks in between the private and shared pools at the granularity of batches, each containing P, uh, order of P blocks. Uh, so one, one issue we faced was that um, the shared pool itself actually requires dynamic memory allocation for uh, the internal nodes. And this seems to make the problem recursive. But it turns out that you can actually, if you manage the private pools properly, then you can allocate and free, um, you can perform the, the shared pool can actually allocate and free directly to the same private pools as the user. And okay, so this is a, that's an overview of how the algorithm works. Um, in summary, uh, weight-free memory allocation is important for, uh, for to design fully weight-free algorithms and data structures. And we saw a, 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 and we consider a special case of this problem where the size of the memory pool and the size of the memory blocks are fixed. And it will be interesting to see how to remove these two assumptions and while still preserving uh, weight freedom. And that's the end of this talk. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Is there any question? Uh, well, I have a question. Do you know if there is a lower bound on the space lower bound on these uh, kind of implementations? Oh, okay. Um, hmm. um, I don't know of any space lower bound on this kind of implementation. So for, for space complexity, we're counting both local and shared variables. So it, uh, an, so it would require at least P space. Um, I'm not sure we can prove a prove that there must be P squared space overhead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, I don't know of any uh, word about. I see. Uh, Faith that once uh, has a question. Um, why does the size K of the block come into the space needed for metadata? It comes in because uh, each of the nodes in the shared pool is allocated from the private pool. So th this node actually has size K. Um, and you could end up with P, um, and each process could have P of these nodes that it hasn't added to the shared pool yet. Yeah, so, so it only comes in because we're, we're, using, um, we're using the same private pool to allocate th the nodes inside the shared pool. And each of these blocks has size K. Yeah, thanks. There's one more question. Uh, if uh, there are some, there are evaluations. Have you performed any evaluation? Um, so we, we haven't performed any evaluation of this, of this yet. I see. Well, so if there are no more questions, we thank again Yun Hao, and uh, we move to the next, to the final, uh, to the last uh, talk of the day. Uh, we have uh, Jiffy, a fast, memory efficient, weight-free, multi-producer, single consumer queue. And uh, the Leva Das is presenting the paper. Great. Uh, so let's start. Okay. So let's look at the features of our queue. Um, it is a multi-producer single consumer queue uh, where multiple concurrent producers uh, fit requests into the same consumer, like in the picture. Um, it is used in sharded data processing system where a single thread is responsible for each shard to avoid costly synchronization while accessing a shard. And data flow programming and load sharing applications, all of these need multi-producer single consumer queue, so uh, it's desirable and useful. Um, uh, it is a linearizable queue, weight-free, unbounded in the amount of items it can hold, high performance, so it's fast, and space efficient, which is desirable to any data structure uh, to hold the same amount of items without uh, with less memory. And it goes hand in hand with high performance because when the data structure is small and can be placed mostly in the SRAM hardware caches, and the access pattern is uh, hardware cache friendly, we gain in performance. And we'll see it in graph. Um, well, there's a lot of work in uh, multi-multi queues because they are the most general ones. However, implementing uh, weight-free multi-producer, multi-consumer queues requires to use help where fast thread helps slower thread to complete their operations. Uh, this requires to utilize complex helper data structures, which increase the memory consumption of such queues and limit their performance and scalability. Um, and many such design employ hardware cache unfriendly memory access pattern because they use pointers to jump uh, to these uh, helper data structures. While we have um, uh, access pattern that is continuous in memory, uh, so we gain in performance. Uh, these are the justice algorithms. Um, and let's look at the total uh, space usage. 
So um, the total heap usage, we can see the Jiffy. This is our algorithm. Uh, use a significantly less uh, space. And let's look at the data caches, the number of misses in the D1 and D3 uh, caches. Uh, we have significantly less uh, misses than uh, we utilize the hardware cache better. Um, okay, and then let's look at the graph. Uh, this is a one second run uh, and we counted the amount of operation each cube performed. Uh, GFI is the blue line, our algorithm. Um, we can see the GFI is significantly faster than the rest of the queues. Uh, in the multiple queues with a single DQ benchmark on the left, uh, we are very close to the fetch and headline, which is the yellow line, uh, because our DQ doesn't perform any synchronization. Uh, even in the NQ only benchmark on the right, um, we have a big gap to the rest of the queues, and that's because we utilize the hardware cache in a better way than the rest of the queues. So uh, that's important. So. Uh, the takeaways from our paper is that we did weight freedom without any helper data structure and helper algorithm. And a lower band has shown that it is necessary in multi-producer, multi-consumer queues. We have a uh, smaller metadata compared to the other queues we benchmarked against. Uh, we have a single flag per item. Um, and the result um, is in access pattern that is more hardware cache friendly. And that's because we have a continuous in access, uh, in memory access pattern. And we do not have a lot of pointers and jumping from uh, metadata to the other. Um, and uh, the queue operation uh, is done without any synchronization. So if your system need a multi producer single consumer queue, use this one and not a multi multi queue, the gain in performance um, and have a smaller structure, smaller memory usage. And it is important to be aware on the memory access pattern to gain performance. Uh, thank you, that was very quickly. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any question? I uh, yeah, here there is a question. Did you include memory management in your queue and the measured queues? Uh, yes, um, it's explained in the uh, 15 minutes talk. Um, once uh, we read an entire uh, buffer of uh, items, we delete it and, um, and we allocated memory as we, as we uh, went on um, when it was necessary. Uh, when the uh, memory, uh, uh, we didn't have an, enough memory uh, for the new items, we allocated new memory. Um, so yeah, we, we try to be as frugal as possible. So thank you again, Dolev. Uh, thank you to all speakers, and thank you to everybody for attending this uh, this session.